What if everything you thought you knew was a lie? Across civilizations, across thousands of generations, there is one question that has weighed upon the collective conscience of humanity heavier than any other. Are we alone? It's a question that our greatest philosophers, our most brilliant scientists, and our wisest theologians have all tried to answer in their own way, and without exception, every single one of them has ultimately fallen short. Be it faith or Fermi, be it intellectual curiosity or grim resignation, we all have our own answers for our lack of an answer. But the burning question still remains, and there's no resolution in sight. But over the past century, and especially in the last few decades, a new hypothesis has emerged to provide a new answer. And perhaps the strangest of all. What if we're not alone in the cosmos at all, but we're being kept in an enclosure we can't even perceive? This is the zoo hypothesis, a solution that both frees us from our cosmic solitude and places us at the mercy of great civilizations that we simply cannot yet comprehend. The problem at the core of the zoo hypothesis is the same one that drives all research and speculation about alien life, the Fermi Paradox. Now, we've actually presented a whole other video on this channel taking a deep dive into the Fermi Paradox, so please do check that out if you'd like to have a more generalized existential panic than the one we'd like to give you today. For now, though, we're just going to run you through the basics to ensure that we're all on the same page to understand what comes next. The Fermi Paradox was posited by a guy called Enrico Fermi. He was an Italian-American theoretical physicist commonly referred to as the architect of the nuclear age or the architect of the atom bomb. He was the sort of Einsteinian figure within the scientific community who could make the world's brightest minds question everything when he did something so simple as positing a question. And the story goes that in 1950, during a lunchtime conversation with colleagues at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States, he got them with a the big one. Where is everybody? Fermi's real question went a little deeper, but the general idea was the same. If the universe had been around for some 14 billion years and we lived in a galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars in a universe of hundreds of billions of galaxies, then was there really no life at all besides what existed on Earth? Since that time, a long list of scientists have endeavored to solve the problem, but every time they've come up short. And that failure is made all the more maddening by just how likely life seems that it should be. Human civilization was not easy to create, if we're using a human scale, but on a cosmic scale, it was a breeze, going from deep in the Stone Age to a world in which everybody's got a pocket supercomputer in the span of a quick hundred thousand years. Humans have tried to quantify how likely these sorts of civilizations should be, and particularly how likely it is that a civilization would be relatively nearby, emitting signals or signatures that humans can then pick up on. But with a sample size of one civilization to study, even well-developed metrics like the Drake Equation have so far fallen short. But when the question at hand morphs from where is everybody to why is nobody there, one proposition stands out above the rest. The Great Filter. According to this line of thought, which is, by the way, going to be fairly important in understanding the zoo hypothesis, there's an unspecified something, a great wall that pops up somewhere within the process by which a lifeless rock of a planet becomes host to great space fairs civilizations. Somewhere in that development process, there is at least one thing that's really hard to do. Perhaps it starts at the very beginning. Making life out of non-living material might be really rare, or it might be highly improbable that single-celled organisms would ever make the transition to multicellular ones. Or perhaps it's a boundary that humans have narrowly avoided or have yet to run into. Maybe it's really hard to discover the potential of splitting the atom without eventually having a nuclear apocalypse. Or maybe the end point of technological progression is always an omniscient killer AI. Here's hoping that neither of those are the case. But but whatever the reason, the Great Filter posits that there's something that stands between humanity and the teeming intergalactic neighborhood we think should surround us. And now we come to it, the zoo hypothesis. Now, in order to put into perspective the meaning behind the zoo hypothesis, we're going to put it in terms of that same Great Filter. Namely, that the filter isn't a natural barrier at all, but a constructed one. According to the zoo hypothesis, the question of a natural Great Filter is answered 
in one of two ways. Either there is no natural great filter at all, and any habitable space rock has a good likelihood of eventually developing a spacefaring civilization, or if there is a natural great filter, it's not all that hard to get through. In fact, the zoo hypothesis posits that the universe might be teeming with life, and that even our own celestial neighborhood is practically overrun with advanced spacefaring aliens, but they don't want us to know it. According to the zoo hypothesis, alien life intentionally avoids contacting the Earth and alerting humanity to its existence. It monitors us, it's well aware of at least the broad strokes of human civilization, but it chooses not to engage with us and instead prefers to watch and observe silently from the sidelines. As for why aliens would choose to do that, human theorists have postulated a range of explanations. According to some, humans might not have reached an acceptable level of development or evolution yet. Perhaps we fleshy, soft beings of yet another evolutionary form to grow into, and oh, when we figure out things like, say, cybernetics or the mechanisms that allow for an upload of consciousness in a digital form, we'll get a congratulatory email from the galactic overlords welcoming us to the club. Perhaps it's a matter of sociocultural development. When a civilization can firmly establish world peace, then it's proved itself trustworthy enough to be informed about the existence of other civilizations, with the understanding that perhaps this new arrival could have a decency not to start an interstellar war. Or perhaps this larger civilization is waiting for a knock at the door with a standing policy that societies like ours can learn to perceive our interstellar neighbors at our own pace and then decide whether to send a spaceship envoy or something to introduce ourselves. Whatever a given person might believe about the exact nature of the zoo, the core of the hypothesis remains the same. Whenever life can evolve to become a spacefaring civilization, it will do so, at least with enough regularity that any emerging civilization is likely to already have interstellar neighbors they can't yet perceive. Also among the assumptions of the zoo hypothesis is that these alien civilizations will either broadly tend to prioritize the survival, independence, and evolution of other worlds and societies, or that Earth got lucky enough to live under the auspices of a friendly, spacefaring society rather than a particularly bloodthirsty or xenophobic one. The hypothesis posits not only the existence of other advanced civilizations, but also the existence of a system of rules by which they might govern an interstellar community. And it's important to be precise here. The zoo hypothesis does not involve any other civilization hiding from Earth for fear of what humans might do if they're discovered. Instead, whatever civilization this is, is either a good bit more powerful than we are, or otherwise centralized far enough away that earthly weapons and spacefaring capabilities are not going to be a threat anytime soon. So that's the basic premise behind the zoo theory. An approximation of rules and norms similar to Star Trek's Prime Directive. Don't interfere with other cultures or other civilizations, even if you're well-intentioned. But when it comes to why a civilization may make that decision, the list of possible answers answers gets a good bit longer. In a broad sense, we can break down a list of hypothetical reasons into two categories. Reasons that are fundamentally about them, and reasons that are about us. If the reasons for keeping Earth in a makeshift zoo are about something to do with this higher civilization, then an explanation would likely fall into one of three categories. Altruistic, protective, or deferential. In an altruistic view, a civilization's decision would likely be rooted in respect for the individual development of planets and cultures as they themselves see fit. An intergalactic community in which species can develop their own unique cultures might be good for everyone. Different societies will find their way to do different ideas, a different different scientific pursuits and different evolutionary pathways. Say that a hypothetical, uncontacted civilization was inclined toward biological engineering rather than the use of non-living machines. Contact them early when their bioengineered tools don't afford them the same solutions that a higher civilization could offer, and they might give up on that biological path of development, but give them another two, three hundred years, and perhaps they'll have produced the sorts of biotech that a society rooted in mechanical systems might never have developed. But whether or not an independently evolved civilization might offer something new to the interstellar community, the more important thing is that they get the chance to develop as they see fit for evolution's own sake. Because that process, in itself, is worth playing out. If the reasons are more protective in nature, it may be to do with a higher civilization's preference not to harm the Earth or its people in some way. Perhaps across a grand cosmic civilization, different groups may still operate across purposes such that if a relatively young society like Earth's were brought into the fold, it could quickly become a pawn of whatever higher machinations are going on. Or perhaps it's a matter of quarantining Earth for Earth's own sake, keeping the planet and its people safe until there's some way to mitigate the risk of an extraterrestrial plague 
wiping out the human population. And if the reasons behind a no-contact policy are differential, then it may be a matter of what we spoke about a few moments ago. The door is open for the people of Earth to notice, come into contact with, and ultimately decide to engage with a higher civilization, but we're supposed to do it on our own time, in the way we choose, instead of having the rules of engagement dictated to us. Then there's the possibility that the reason for a no-contact policy is about us, where, again, we'll break down the possible reasons for non-engagement into three categories. Human nature, quarantine, and underdevelopment. When it comes to human nature, well, this one's easy enough to figure out, really. A civilization watching from elsewhere would likely have seen humanity grind its way through two world wars, engage in a massive global arms race, and perpetrate atrocity after atrocity after atrocity in every conceivable direction. At times, even for us Earthlings, the depravity of our species can be shocking. Just imagine how that must look for an interstellar civilization for genocide was a new word introduced to them during their study of the human race. Given humanity's propensity to make war and at times its sheer enthusiasm for doing so, it's not inconceivable that a more advanced civilization may have decided that we just aren't worth a headache. Then there's the quarantine option, where we don't need to just account for earthly diseases and parasites, although historical events like the Columbian Exchange and fictional accounts like the War of the Worlds certainly offer fodder for speculation there. Just as feasible as the idea that pathogens might need to be quarantined is the potential to quarantine technology or even ideas. When it comes to trying to guess what sorts of technologies are difficult to achieve, we only know our own human perspective on this matter with a sample size of one. Perhaps something like the fission bomb is actually really difficult to work out, but we humans either had a breakthrough we didn't realize was a breakthrough or are somehow inclined to have an easier time working out the requisite principles. The same could be true for AI or for our nascent endeavor into quantum mechanics, or perhaps the fact that we figured out gene editing is a particular problem. Perhaps the interstellar community is a particularly democratic organization that's never had to reckon with ideas of fascism, or perhaps it's a particular fascist organization that's never had to reckon with ideas of democracy. Of course, such a civilization probably isn't doing either Earth-style democracy or fascism, but you're probably getting the point. Either way, the Earth's got something on board that other civilizations would like to keep at arm's length. And lastly, there's the possibility that humans just aren't deemed ready yet in terms of our technological development. Now, we here on Earth have no idea where the broad arc of technological progress ultimately leads, but given that it took humanity just 103 years to get from the right flyer to a flyable prototype of the F-35, it seems entirely likely that the breakneck pace of development can keep up for some time. We don't know what we don't know, and while we here on Earth might think that our space stations and our iPhones are very, very impressive, other civilizations might look at these developments and consider them closer to the Stone Age than to attaining what these civilizations have proven able to do. Instead of the deferential civilization that we mentioned earlier, this is the other side of that same coin. The aliens have a checklist to merit galactic inclusion, and we simply haven't checked all of the boxes. Related to the zoo hypothesis are a second set of explanations referred to as the laboratory hypothesis. Really, the core of these two concepts are mostly the same, except in the laboratory hypothesis, humanity isn't just subject to an isolation policy, it's subject to experimentation. Under this interpretation, humanity is being kept separate because of the data it provides. Perhaps that's to do with an alien civilization's curiosity about, say, the evolution of humans and other forms of terrestrial life, and yes to the folks in the comment section who've got their own stories of being abducted and probed by aliens, that's your cue. Or perhaps it's a broader study into the development of individual civilizations on individual planets, and we're all part of one broader data point, probably being compared to other isolated worlds like ours. If that's the case, and this very video is being poured over by some alien philosopher watching us reckon with our isolation, well, then, hello! <laughs> Hope you're good! And finally, there's one more possibility to consider, that this other civilization may have judged, either by conjecture or experience, with other worlds like ours, that informing humans of their existence may lead to the destruction of humanity itself. To illustrate how this might happen, we'll give you a basic scenario. What if tomorrow an alien spaceship popped down in the middle of the most diplomatically neutral nation in the world and said, take us to your leader, but they made it clear that no, they didn't mean bring us to the UN. 
Instead, they meant bring us to the one person who can speak for all of you. Considering the myriad reasons that humanity has decided to be at war with itself as we speak, then certainly any interpretation of human logic would suggest that the chance to become the world's de facto most powerful person, nation, government, or what have you, before the other guy does, is something that world leaders could justify some major bloodshed for. Given the choice between leaving humanity alone and setting off a World War III that would ensure that there's very little of humanity left in the aftermath, it's understood that a concerned party amongst the stars might choose to keep their distance. So that's the zoo hypothesis in a nutshell. A clean, thorough explanation as to why the Fermi paradox has gone unanswered, and one that offers a wide range of mechanisms and processes of reasoning to lead to the same result, an isolated planet Earth. But unfortunately, the zoo hypothesis leaves some unanswered questions of its own, and ones that risk bringing the entire hypothesis crashing down. At its most basic level, the zoo hypothesis has one key fundamental flaw that risks disqualifying it from serious scientific discussion at all. It is a hypothesis that cannot be tested. It's not as if humanity isn't at least checking to see if aliens might be out there. We're searching the stars and so far we found nothing. If an alien civilization does exist around us and they don't want us to know that they're there, then they're going to do a damn good job at not giving us any hints as to their existence. In that case, there's nothing to test until and unless we hit whatever threshold they're waiting for, and although an ideal time to let us in on their existence might have been when we figured out the zoo hypothesis, they still haven't seen it fit to say hello. Not only that, but the idea that an alien civilization would be able to keep up a veil of silence around a world, let alone many worlds, is a lot easier said than done. Anybody who's ever, say, texted a complaint about their romantic partner to a trusted friend only to realize after the fact that they sent that text to their partner by accident knows firsthand how easy it is for small, stupid slip-ups to jeopardize something very important. Scale that up to an entire civilization and the idea that nobody ever has a bit of a brain fart and send a radio signal in Earth's direction or crash lands their space probe would imply a level of operational competence that is certainly alien to us humans. Not only that, but just a single disruptive element could be enough to bring the whole veil of secrecy crashing down one single group of space activists, for example, or a rogue elements within this hypothetical larger civilization or even a change in policy if alien governments work anything like earthly ones. The more beings and subcultures within this broader civilization, the higher the odds of an eventual disruption. There are, of course, some counter-arguments. Perhaps a civilization can only get to the point of isolating planets like Earth after they've grown out of these sorts of disruptive impulses more broadly. After all, the process of growing into an interstellar civilization would seem to favor civilizations without the tendency to self-destruct or hold themselves back via conflict or division. Or perhaps these decisions aren't made by alien beings at all, but a higher artificial superintelligence perhaps left behind long ago and programmed by a civilization that's long since disappeared. And even if this blockade were imposed by a complex culture of alien beings, there wouldn't necessarily have to be zero historical breaches of isolation either, just none that impact Earth specifically with the relatively short span of human civilization thus far. But even still, the potential for such disruptive elements a gaping hole in the zoo hypothesis that has yet to be addressed concretely. But whether the zoo hypothesis ends up being the one humanity ultimately sticks with or ends up becoming a relic that fails to explain our human situation, some scientists expect that we might know sooner rather than later. In a 2024 paper published in Nature Astronomy by astrobiologists Ian Crawford and Dirk schulz machuch the steady progress of human technology is actually a ticking clock, counting down the moments until we as a civilization are able to rule out all but two options to explain our isolation. The zoo hypothesis or nothing. Their premise rests on something called the hart tipler conjecture, which basically says that the complete absence of evidence for alien life forms can only be explained by there simply not being any alien life forms to observe. As humans get better at studying our own world and the many thousands of exoplanets and star systems that we already know about, and as we continue to find more, it becomes less and less likely that other life forms will evade us. Even if we suppose that civilizations may actually be uncommon, human technology should be able to identify biosignatures indicating even single-celled life on other planets and within the next few decades. It's in searching for those basic life forms that humanity should get its answer. If they exist at all, they'll produce recognizable chemical traces that we can measure and study even without visiting these planets. We've already got a clear idea of the biosignatures we'd be looking for and some estimates on how long it'd take us to be able to reliably evaluate exoplanets 
for those signatures, suggesting that we can do it in the next 50 years or less. Charles McCook, one of the two lead researchers in the particular study, suggests it'll be just 15 years. But while there's reason to be excited that humanity might find some indicator of life beyond our planet within a few decades, we've also got to recognize the other side of the equation, that we may find nothing. It's there that Crawford and Charles McCook's prediction is realized, and humanity is faced with two, and only two possibilities. Either extraterrestrial life does exist and it's being hidden from us, or it's not there at all and we are truly, incontrovertibly alone. If we do make it to such an outcome, then it'll either be on humanity to advance to a point that other civilizations can no longer hide at all, or it'll be on them to reveal themselves. That's the thing about the zoo hypothesis. If it truly does represent humanity's situation among the cosmos, then we'll have no way of knowing until either humanity changes or we're finally let in on the ultimate secret.